look at that honey. Isn't that just gorgeous, seeing the bees build their honey in the flow frames? It's got some nice full frames there. You can see the capping. They've been doing so well, this hive, collecting the honey from the paperbark flowers. Paperbark is the, it gets called the rain tree from the indigenous people here because when it rains, it bursts into flower any time from autumn all the way through to spring. So we get these beautiful pulses of nectar throughout the winter and you can smell the honey as it's being made, as, as that nectar's being dried, wafting right through the office here at Flow HQ. Tomorrow is World Bee Day. So we're going to be talking bees today. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below. Also, if you've got questions about flow hives or bees in general, put them in the comments and we'll get to answering those. So it's amazing that World Bee Day is actually on the calendar because that recognises the crucial, important part that bees play in pollination, in our agriculture. But it's not only the European honeybee that does the incredible work and an amazing amount of pollination and honey production, it's also those little native bees. Now we've got almost 20,000 species of native bee around the globe and those are crucial to pollination of many plant species that, that we rely on. And without that system, that network of, of insects and, and other animals pollinating the flowers, then our whole system grinds to a halt. So we certainly owe it to the bees. So, so World Bee Day is an important moment to actually think about the importance of these little unsung heroes of our world and recognise them for the, in the whole system that we all completely rely on. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below and we'll get to answering them. Great, so we've got a question that's come in um, from Kevin actually in New Zealand, just wondering, how far do bees fly? Okay, so a hive like this is capable of, well let's just take it back one step. So a single bee might forage up to say 10 kilometres, which is quite a long way, but they generally stay within three kilometres or a couple of miles. So that's the distance they fly, right? And about half of a bee, let's say there's 50,000 bees in a strong colony like this, but half of them or more might go out to the flowers in a day. And each one of those foraging bees might pollinate up to, say, 2,000 flowers in that day, which is absolutely incredible. So if you do the maths on that, it's 50 million flowers that a hive like this could pollinate in a day. And that's why humans have dragged the European honeybee all around the world wherever they go because they're such extreme pollinators and honey producers. It's really this win-win where we get this beautiful thing we call honey as well as this amazing amount of pollination which keeps our whole agricultural system going. Getting back to your question, how far do they fly? They fly, if you, if you added up all of the bee flight, let's say 25,000 uh, forager bees, and let's say they averaged about five kilometers of flight in a day. They can do a lot more, but let's say the average was five. Then that works out at something like 125,000 kilometers of flight in a day, which is roughly three times circumference of the world. Wow, <laughs> it's just incredible how, how busy bees are, and that's where the saying busy bees is so true. Great question. Fantastic, Cedar. I've got a question coming in. Do having um, the honeybees, the European style of bees, impact on the native wild bees? Okay, so I've uh, been keeping both the, the uh, what's called uh, the sugar bag bee here in Australia and the European honeybee. And what I've found is there doesn't seem to be any kind of conflict between them. You see them coexisting on the flowers just fine. However, you do get concern from, um, from ecologists, from um, specialists saying that um, there, there could be competing issues. Now, 
I think what we need to do, especially on World Bee Day, is recognise that that uh, it's important we're all working to protect whether it be the European honeybee or the or, or our native bee species and it's really important that we don't start um, infighting if you like because we're all working for a common cause and the real problem is lack of habitat and that's due to the widespread human use of land due to, to the way we've been farming and and all sorts of things so Basically, it's important that we uh, recognise that we're, we're working towards this common goal of bringing back the habitat, of learning to farm in different ways. And that's about the, what the Bee Friendly Farming Project is all about, is recognising the importance of bees, whether it be the native bee species or the European honeybee, and, and making sure we're, we're turning back the clock to bring some habitat back. Because without the habitat, then we start losing species. Germany, 70% insect lost. That is so alarming. And, and these kind of stats are cropping up around the world. And if we don't do something about it, we're, we're in grave danger of our whole system really uh, heading towards collapse. So World Bee Day, super important to look after our bees, whether they be the native bees or the European honeybees that do the incredible amount of crop pollination that we also depend on for our food chain. Great, thanks Cedar. This is a question from Kevin, he's actually in Tennessee in the USA, um, coming into mid late spring. Installed a five frame nuke today in um, his Flow Hive 2 Plus. Um, it was busting, buzzing with bees. Just wondering, should he feed it for a while or just leave it as it is? So that question's best answered by your local bee keepers. They have the answer of whether you should be feeding bees in your area. In this area, we've got general drips and drabs of flowers all year round, so it doesn't really um, warrant feeding your bees. Um, however, you can if you want to. Um, but in some areas, the, the, uh, beekeepers have strategies where they'll get a jump on, on the season, or perhaps um, you're going to need to feed them prior to, to the winter, depending on where you are in the world, in, in order to build up enough stores. So. Um, ask your local beekeepers whether you should be feeding bees in your area. And look at that beautiful honey pouring out of the hive. It's, um, it's just perfect, isn't it? It's yeah. untouched. It's zero processing. It's ready for the table. It's harvested from a single frame and you'll find the flavours from a single frame will differ. And that's one of the wonderful things about our Flow Hive invention is being able to harvest multiple flavours from the hive in a really easy way. Oh, it looks so beautiful. It's so golden from here. It's amazing. It's going to be nice on toast. <laughs> <laughs> Got a shout out to you, Seeds, from Cynthia Kremer from Faith Sanctuary, Sanctuary saying howdy doody to you. Um, now another question, Tony's just recently split his hive because they looked like they were going to swarm. One hive didn't have a queen and one created a new one. Should he replace the queens in both hives or just the one without the queen? So, uh, it's fantastic getting in there and making a split. We've got some great training videos showing you how to do that, which I'm sure you probably looked at. The, so you've got a few options there. One is you can allow the bees to raise their own queen. And to do that, they need uh, young larvae or eggs down the cells. That The young larvae has to be under three days old. So it's either eggs down the cells or the slightest little crescent moon of a larvae. And that way they can raise a queen from that. They can turn it into a, a queen cell feed it royal jelly for the duration of its uh, pupae phase and it will turn into a queen. So bees will usually do that if they've got the resources to do so, but not always. So I'm not sure where you are up to in your split, but um, if, if they don't have the resources or they didn't get it together, then yes, as you say, introducing a queen would be a great thing to do in the hive that doesn't have a queen. Um, you may choose to introduce queens regardless and that would be for the reasons of getting specific genetics off a bee breeder. So breeders will breed for often uh, traits of being nice and calm and gentle which makes them easier to work, uh, easier to, to really um, do your brood inspections and so on. 
and they'll also breed for things like hygienic behaviour, ones that are good at keeping uh, disease away and so on. So buying in Queens is a great idea if you can, um, however it is a little bit easier just to allow them to, to raise their own queen as well because you don't have to go back in there and reintroduce that queen. Wow, it's definitely the paperback. It has that beautiful, beautiful uh, golden colour and this kind of um, super sweet, almost um, burnt toffee flavour. It's, uh, it's great to, to have that flavour come in again and as the seasons come around you recognise again that, that honey that's coming in. It's so beautiful, isn't it, Sarah? It looks so thick and compared to some of the other honeys that we've been harvesting that are so clear, this does look, I mean, it's like golden syrup or something, isn't it? It looks incredible. It is. It definitely looks like it's got a higher viscosity this morning. It's, um, depending on the temperature as well, that'll affect the viscosity of the honey. But it um, looks like it's got a nice low moisture content, um, which means it'll keep nicely on the shelf as well. The bees are aiming to get that moisture content down below 20%, hopefully around 18 is what um, commercial honey producers aim for and that way it, it's very unlikely for any fermentation to occur. Um, if you've harvested early and it's very liquid in the jar you may find you'll want to consume that before fermentation occurs or keep it in the fridge but normally if you're harvesting when it's uh, you can see the capping then you'll get some nice honey with a low moisture content that'll keep um, almost indefinitely if the lid's on the jar. They found honey 3,000 years old in Egyptian terms and it was still good. Hard to believe. <laughs> Hard to believe. I don't think that would happen in your house, Seed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it's going to last um, three days in um, my house. Look, got a question. Mrs. Maguire from Massachusetts is asking, could you talk a little bit about the ventilation in the flow hive? Yes, yeah, sure. So, what we've done with the Flow Hive 2 and now Flow Hive 2 Plus is add some, some ventilation control. Now, bees, in my experience, prefer to vent their hive from the bottom of the hive. It's a bit counterintuitive, but what I find is if you put vents up the top of the hive in the gable or, or through the roof, they tend to just block it up. They don't really like a ventilation up the top. They tend to create a cycle in the hive as they fan with their wings to fan the air, air um, up and down and out. And that cycle is really important for uh, maintaining the right humidity in the hive and for drying out that nectar. Now, what we've done with the Flow Hive 2, if you have a look under the shelf here, or perhaps it's easier on this hive here, is we've put a, a vented cover on our tray. Now, what this vented cover is designed to do is to be adjustable ventilation. So right now, the vents are on the upside, which means air can flow through those vents and then up under the screened bottom board. So there's a complete screen bottom board, which allows beetles and pests like that to drop through into a, a tray to catch those beetles below. If you then turn this cover around, what happens is this area comes into contact with the tray and that limits ventilation because the, the, uh, the, there's no little airflow now uh, travelling up under the screen. So as it gets colder you can switch that around if you want to. Some people run screen bottom boards with no tray, no ventilation control in the snow and they leave it like that all year round so there's different schools of thoughts on it but the idea there is if you want to adjust that ventilation let's say it's quite hot bees are bearding out the front they're clearly clearly hot and getting out of the way so ventilation can occur in the hive then uh, make sure you give them some more ventilation I'm just looking over here look at this little scene going on. There's, there's one bee trying to rip a drone bee's wings off and whoop, just missed that one. It's amazing when you stand around and watch your bees, the things you notice. So right then it looked like um, a, a drone was perhaps being sacrificed. Now drones 
are the male bees. They don't actually do much work around the hive. They tend to uh, just get fed by the bees and their job is really to share the genetics around. They'll fly off to a drone congregation area and wait for a queen to fly past and then it'll be a high speed aerial mating flight that takes place. Now, if a hive is, is struggling a bit, there's not enough nectar to go around, the worker bees will actually rip the drone's wings off and kick them out of the hive to die, which is pretty brutal, but that's what they do in order to save the colony, is limit the amount of food um, that's being needed by those drones. Mm, so it's got any recommendations, Cosmic Shy is asking, books that you might recommend about bee behaviour for beginners? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. If people can put in the comments any books they've read that, that they've found fantastic, that would be great. There's um, all sorts of uh, great books out there. Um, there's Honeybee Democracy, um, which is, that's kind of more advanced. Um, there's uh, the one that I used to uh, read, um, you know, uh, going back, um, uh, 20 or so years ago was called The Bee Book and that was just a general outline of beekeeping here in Australia. But there's, we've actually got a whole library inside of bee books and um, I think we have a recommended reading page too if somebody could put that in the comments below. If you want to watch it in video form, check out thebeekeeper.org. It's free to try and it's also a fundraiser and in there is going through the very basics of beekeeping, talking about all the roles the bees play, to, talking about the, the different um, uh, things they do, like uh, create, just the whole process of creating honey is extraordinary in itself and bee bread and so on. And it's, it's in a very uh, visual format with my sister's amazing footage of um, macro bees. So check that out too and um, that, that's a lot of great learning there. And in that program, experts from around the world pitch in to um, help us all learn about the different types of beekeeping all around the world. And in the end, the idea is with that program is it takes you from square one right through to a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping. But people are, uh, are raving fans of that education content. So head over to thebeekeeper.org and check that out. Great, thanks Cedar. Um, so Fred's asking, he's in central Texas, just wondering when is it too late to start your hive? Um, he's saying they're in the height of their wildflower season, but just wondering should he wait till spring or can you just start beekeeping any time? So you can certainly um, uh, Best answered by your local beekeepers. Here where we are, you can start a hive almost all year round. If you have the choice, springtime, wherever you are in the world, is the prime time. That's when most flowers are flowering. That's where you're going to get the most action and a really quick start to your, your hive building up in numbers. However, you can uh, start later and certainly around here where we're still splitting hives even in the autumn um, but in, in some places you wouldn't be doing that places that get long cold winters you'd you'd be starting your hives in the spring and the summertime look at that it's so beautiful mm. and so tasty mm -hmm. um, so and it also depends which way you start. Some people will start by grabbing a whole existing colony and transferring that into a flow hive. Now, if you're going that way, then you can just about do that any time of year because all you're doing is changing the um, wooden wear and adding our, uh, our invention, our flow frames on top. So you could do that any time if you're starting with a, a bigger colony. If you're starting with a really small one like a package then it's more sensitive and you might have to feed it if you've started late in the season and so on. Great, so you're just wondering, a couple of people asking, there's a few questions on your thoughts on the polystyrene beehive boxes. Okay, so, so some, there's all sorts of hive types in the world and in the end 
you know, if you're interested to try something, just try it. The idea is you see what works for you and your bees. Um, for me, I don't love the idea of polystyrene. I don't think it's a great contribution to our world. Uh, and that is why um, I choose not to use the, the polystyrene. Um, and oh, I don't like the idea of my bees being inside a polystyrene box. You know, when you open one of those poly boxes that the broccoli comes in or whatever, and there's just kind of this smell to it, this like chemical smell to it. Um, I don't really uh, want to keep my bees in that. That's a personal thing. Um, certainly a lot of people enjoy keeping bees in, in styrofoam boxes as well. Um, my favourite is wood because it's nice and natural, it mimics their home in tree hollows and so on. And uh, it's also um, something we can do sustainably is harvest wood and make really useful things with them. So Seed, on, on from that question, another one is could you add a flow hive super to a poly box? Certainly can. So this, this hive is a bit of a conglomerate of a few different things and it's an example of how you can add one box on top of another. So this is our Flow Hive Classic um, Aracaria Super on top of a Western Red Cedar uh, lower hive. So uh, we've just done that to show that you can do that really and um, sometimes you find that there's not a perfect match in size but it's good enough to add uh, a, a box on top. So you could just get a super like this and we, we sell those just as the super with the frames and add it to any standard beehive. However, there is some things you will um, you'll need to look out for. One is the sizing. So the, our flow frame six and seven match the Langstroth hive sizes of eight and 10. So we've tried to do our sizing so it matches what's out there already. The Langstroth hive, which is this size and shape, is the, the most common beehive in the world. And we've matched our equipment so that you can do just that by adding a super. One thing to look out for though is typically hives will slope forward so rain doesn't come in the entrance. And that means you may need to slope it back when it's time to harvest. It also means it messes up this little leak back system. So it's better if you can have the hive slope towards the rear. And this is about a three degree slope and our levels in the side help you set that up. And the reason why it's good is the uh, we've got a system here that allows honey to drain back into the hives. If I take out a little, little cap here um, then you can see that the bees block it up sometimes for a start but um, there's a little point there where any remaining honey can drain back into the hive for the bees to reuse. Now, depending on how the bees seal the flow frame parts, it will depend whether uh, you get a little bit of honey build up in that area, and sometimes you do. Now, if you had the hive sloping forward, it would build up at the wrong end and couldn't return to the hive. So you may get um, a bunch of muck coming to the back. Uh, if you're in a humid climate, fermented honey, that you'll have to drain away before you harvest. If you're using a super on a conventional hive that's facing forward. Long answer, but yes, <laughs> you can, and many beekeepers do, add a flow super to their conventional hive, and they work with that. If you've got a screen bottom board, you could still maintain the tilt facing backwards, because any water that does en enter could go down through the screen and not pool in the hive. You don't want water pooling in the hive. Fantastic. And that, that slope cedar, it's only a couple of degrees, isn't it, for people to, if they're wanting to add supers to other hives? It's about three degrees, so you can measure that with an app on your phone, or, or um, it's about one inch uh, from the front to the back. If you started off with a level, you would raise the front just one inch. Right. Um, so Jeff's asking, when's a good time to add your super to the brood box? Should all the frames be completely drawn out or is parsley drawn out okay? Okay, it's best to wait till they're, they're all drawn out. So down in the bottom box here, if you're unfamiliar with beekeeping, you've got conventional wood and wax frames. The bees are just drawing their comb uh, as they've done for, for since the beginning of time. and if uh, 
you put the super on quite early, what you're doing is giving them a home that's a bit larger, there's a lot more for them to look after. And what you'll find is um, it, it might just slow them down a bit, and particularly if you're still getting really cold nights, it'll be harder for them to keep it all warm, it'll be harder for them to, to raise their young because they, they like to keep the brood nest at about body temperature. So uh, best to wait until they've completed all of the brood frames in the bottom box by drawing out their wax in them. And there's a lot of bees before you put your super on. So that's just a tip as you get started. Start with the bottom box, let them really build up, and then put your super on. The super is a name for honey collection box. And in this case, it's a flow super, which allows you to harvest the honey in this gentle, easy way. Great. Stuart's asking, um, how long can bees get nectar for from a flowering grey box? Okay, so different species uh, have, diff have really different nectar flow patterns and I'm not 100% sure on the grey box, but um, some species will have, uh, uh, be producing nectar for, for many weeks and other species might only produce nectar for a day and then it'll go away again and a few days later it might come back again. Other species like the bloodwood will have a pulse of nectar in the daytime and when that's all used up, um, they, they, there's no more nectar flow for that day, but then at night time, they'll pulse again for the bats because they know that there's those nocturnal pollinators that also are coming for nectar. So it's, a, um, it, it's re very tree specific and um, yeah, it's really intriguing. This paperback has this pattern where for about three days, you'll have an abundance of nectar. It's sickly sweet smell just wafting through the office, an extreme amount of nectar coming in. And that's what this honey is. And then it'll disappear again. It might be another week or two, a bit of rain comes and sets it off again. And away you go again for another three or four days of, of that paper bark nectar coming in. Nice. Cedar, this is um, Anne from North East Victoria um, here in Australia, has packed down the hives and has just got that one brood box for winter. Um, it was suggested by some locals, I think, to, to put a little ideal above the queen excluder um, for winter just to give them a bit more space. Just wondering, will our flow hive two roofs, um, do you think, fit on her ideal box? They will, um, but Sometimes you'll find, in fact, here's a good example of it. If you've, if you've got the flow hive too, just make sure the inner cover that comes with it is, um, is up in there. And you see like this, the inner cover is um, sitting up a little bit. And that's because the flow hive two roof doesn't actually telescope over this box. It does on the, the flow hive two super, but it doesn't on this one. So um, it'll just sit up a bit on top of that ideal most likely. Um, so uh, that's okay too, but um, it's just something to be aware of that it won't slide over the top of all shapes and sizes of box. Yeah, great Cedar. Um, I think people are just commenting on what it's such a beautiful day it is here and Nicole is asking, where in the world are you people? <laughs> We're in Byron Bay, well nearby to Byron Bay. It is a, it is a beautiful day here, you can see it's um, really twinkly. The first whales have just been spotted passing by, which is, which is a beautiful thing. And from the office here, in the distance, we can see the humpback whales breaching sometimes. And it's a beautiful area where the little rainforest is still on the, on the forested hills and coming right down and meeting the sea. And in the valley below, we've got all sorts of farmland, macadamia, sugarcane, and, and things like that. Great. Todd's asking, Cedar, will the flow frames ever leak? And if they do, is it after you've drained them? And is that a problem or will the bees just lick it all up? So sometimes you, depending on how the bees have capped the, the frame and also depending on the viscosity, sometimes you'll get, you get uh, thinner honey above thicker honey and things like that. And what that could uh, en end up doing is honey spilling into the hive while you are harvesting. 
If you have a lot of that happening, then do get in contact. There could be a reason why perhaps the slope on your hive isn't set right or perhaps there's actually an issue that's happening with your frames. Perhaps the bees have got a whole lot of wax built up down in the bottom cell due to the frames not being closed perfectly, things like that. So we can help you troubleshoot um, uh, that, that issue. However, it's normal to get a little bit of spillage inside the hive and the bees will simply reuse that. If you're, it, it, the problem only really happens when you go to harvest all your frames at once and you can end up sometimes um, with, with a bit of honey building up and catching in the tray below. So um, uh, that's just something to look out for. Obviously if you're just harvesting a frame then that, you know, that that's, uh, doesn't cause um, any issue at, or, or really much honey at all to make its way down to the catchment tray below. So um, it's also a bit more efficient to do it that way. So if, if you do have that problem where you're worried about um, spills inside the hive, then just harvest um, one, two or three frames and leave the rest for the bees and that way that it'll limit that issue. Great. Cedar, this is uh, Giselle's asking a question um, and it's to do with the tray. I've just noticed that there's a little bit of a, a patch at the front entry of their ho -ho flow hive <laughs> and they can't work out if it's honey or oil. There's no cracks anywhere. But they're just wondering, I guess, because the tray is sloped because of that three degrees, um, maybe do you think they've put too much oil in it for it to be leaking out? But I guess the leak is at the back, not at the front. Yes, okay. So what we did, to, we've got a three degree slope on the hive and then we've counter sloped the tray. So if you have a look when you're building it, you'll notice that the rails that the tray slides on is opposite to the slope of the hive and that keeps it more level. But it does sound like you've perhaps put a bit too much oil in your beetle catching tray below. So you really only need enough to cover all of the, uh, the bottom and that's enough to catch those beetles. So perhaps you could um, just uh, tip some of it out and put the tray back in and see how you go. Yep, great, Cedar. Um, Sufian's asking, what do um, do if the super box, obviously they're looking through the window, looks a bit of moisture and a bit foggy. Is that an issue? So that typically happens when you've got the cooler times and the bees uh, have a humid environment inside their hive as they dry their nectar and so on and whenever you get a cool surface next to humid air you'll get some condensation. Now the windows typically um, will get more condensation because you've got slightly less insulation around the edges here as there's, as there's a gap all the way around. So it's pretty normal when it gets cooler but it's also a sign that um, the bee numbers are a bit low in your hive. If you've got lots of bee numbers, then what you'll find is that uh, you won't see that. So it could be a good idea to check in and make sure everything's okay. Perhaps your bees are just building up and um, you, you'll probably find you can, you can do nothing and the bees will build up and occupy that space and the condensation will go away. There's different schools of thought. Some people say that condensation is an important part. It's a water source for your bees, particularly in those cooler times when the bees are uh, uh, in, in those cold places where they're hibernating. But what you want to avoid is excessive condensation dripping from the roof because that means you could get wet bees. So if there's crazy amounts of condensation, there's water running uh, down from the inner cover onto your bees, then you might need to do something about that. But if it's just on the walls of the hive, a bit of condensation, then it could even be helpful for your bees in those cooler times. Uh, so any tips on cleaning your flow frames if they've, uh, they've got propolis in them? Okay, so propolis is that material that's collected from tree sap and the bees use it. You can actually see some down here where, where it's this brown uh, little pieces of tree sap they're, they're um, placing around the place. So you can tell the difference because of the colour and texture. It's also um, slightly softer. You can actually just um, uh, really easily um, scrape it and mould it and if you get a big lump of it it's actually a good thing to chew on a bit like chewing gum. It doesn't taste like chewing gum, it's um, usually a lot more bitter 
but um, good if you've got a sore throat or something like that. Now, if you've got um, propolis, then uh, in your flow frames, it's generally the bees are going to coat all of the surfaces of the flow frames in wax and sometimes propolis or sometimes a bit of a mix. And it's actually very hard to get off and you don't necessarily need to get it off. It's more a, a case of making sure the parts are moving. Um, it's, just make sure your parts are still moving down to the cell formed position. And to do that you put the key in the top and just leave it there for a little while. So if you have got excessive build up, the parts, if you like, are moving from this back into the cell formed position and then the, um, the bees will then clean out any excessive propolis that might have uh, been building up below. If, you, if you've just done a quick close and the parts are sitting up a little bit, you can get a bunch of propolis down in this area that when you go to harvest uh, restricts the channel for honey to flow down. So a tip there is if you've got excessive build up, leave the key into the top slot. Uh, in an extreme case, you could put, you could take the frame out and uh, leave it in the sun uh, or, or in a uh, black plastic bag in the sun with the key in, in the top and that will move all the parts into that cell formed position, put it back in and the bees will then chew away the excessive propolis build up in, in that lower cell. Thanks, Cedar. Um, Kenny Taylor from New Hampshire in the United States is asking, how often should you check the brood box to see if the honeybees are building the honeycomb for the queen to lay her eggs? Question once more. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Kenny from New Hampshire in the US. How often should he check the brood box to see if the honeybees are building the honeycomb for the queen to lay her eggs? Okay, so as you get started, if you've started with a nuke or a a uh, package um, or, or a split, then it's a good idea to get in there, depending on which type of um, frame you're using. We promote the naturally drawn comb, uh, keeping it perfectly natural for the bees, just the wooden frame, the comb guide, and the bees are drawing their comb. So I would get in there um, every couple of weeks in the beginning just to make sure they're building nice and straight because if they're building nice and straight then it makes it easier later you don't have to go through a process of, um, of uh, straightening the comb out which um, can be a bit tedious and once they've built nice and straight they'll tend to follow suit and the whole thing becomes easier to manage later if you're using foundation then you don't have to get in there quite so much but you have to go through that tedious uh, phase of waxing and wiring the frames in the bottom box and that will generally keep them building uh, straight but not always. It's also a nice thing as you start in beekeeping to just get the feel of opening up the hive and looking in at what's going on. Every time you look in you'll see something new, you'll learn something new and the curiosity will be there to find out more about beekeeping and it's an important step because that then you feel comfortable to, to go and, and do your brood inspections later. So here in Australia, uh, beekeepers are getting, uh, doing a full brood inspection, going through every frame at least a couple of times a year, checking for disease issues. Now that's an important thing as a responsible beekeeper to do. But if you haven't um, gone through that process in the beginning of learning to do your inspections, it might be a bit daunting. Not the end of the world, just get someone to help you as you, as you get into that bottom box and inspect your brood frames. Uh, ask your local beekeepers what they do and depending that there, there could be things you need to do, let's say you've got varroa mite in your country, uh, then you may need to go through uh, some management plan with those mites as well, which might mean getting into the brood box more often, depending on what strategy you're using. I'm just watching a bee go this drone again, trying to rip this wing off here. It's, uh, we were talking about that earlier, how the drones will sometimes get sacrificed if there's not enough forage to go around, not enough nectar, uh, honey in the hive and they'll go, these drones aren't really doing much work, they're not storing any honey, I'm going to rip their wings off and kick them out. So this worker bee's doing that job and um, 
sometimes you see these big tussles there they've fallen to the ground they're still going at it and that poor drone uh, may not ever make it back into the hive again <laughs> that's great great filming there stone this is zeroing right in on that drone um, Cedar, Deborah's asking, just amazed that there's so many bees flying around you, um, but you're just wondering, do you ever get stung? And if you do get stung, does it mean that more bees will then start to sting you? Sometimes. So I, I do get stung a fair bit, but it's mainly through complacency. I don't mind getting stung too much. And you might have noticed one bee stung me on the lip earlier on while we were, I was standing here talking. When I came out here this morning, I noticed that there was a little bit of aggressive behaviour and I thought, oh, OK, I better make sure I get a veil ready. If you are new to beekeeping, protect yourself. Wear, wear your, your, your bee suit when you're around your hive. You don't want to have a start to beekeeping that's a bit scary. And, and that will limit uh, the, the stings and make beekeeping more enjoyable as you learn and get going. As you get more experience, you'll probably um, work out whether you know having a few stings is a problem for you or not. And then uh, you will um, perhaps get, uh, bee beekeepers tend to get a little blase. Um, my good friend, uh, Pete Wilkins, does a lot of beekeeping, he does a lot of beekeeping here at the office as well and he doesn't wear a bee suit at all. But his tolerance for stings is much higher than mine. I'll definitely be wearing my bee suit if I'm doing inspections. Right. So now how much space do you, would you sort of recommend for a new beekeeper if they're wanting to get a beehive? So the wonderful thing about beekeeping is it's a very small footprint. So it allows you to create real produce from a very small footprint in your backyard or your balcony. My sister kept multiple hives on a balcony in the middle of Berlin. And that's amazing that she was able to have real produce, have her connection to, to the world of the interconnectedness of all the flowers and trees and bring that nectar back into your hive. So it, I think beekeeping, one of the reasons why it's so popular is you don't need to go and buy a farm to do it. You can either keep them in a, in a small backyard or even on your balcony or on your rooftop in the city and the bees will then go and find the flowers. Now having said that, there can be some issues um, with bees. So it's uh, with uh, particularly the flight path, particularly if you get um, bees that have an aggressive trait um, however, that can be fixed by introducing new genetics, by changing the queen to a new queen. Uh, and uh, so you will need to consider um, uh, pets and humans as they pass, particularly in front of the hive. Now, the way we've set up these hives here in this top row here at the office isn't particularly good. And it's probably the reason why I got a sting earlier, because all of the bees flight path is coming past us this way. It's better if they can fly straight out of the entrance and away and they're less likely to accidentally run into you and give you a sting. So uh, there's things to think about. We've got um, videos about situating your hive that you can look at. Tune in on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook live streams and also at thebeekeeper.org and you'll find lots of training material and answers to your questions. And if you've got uh, answers to the questions people are asking below. Tune in and answer them as well. It's a fantastic thing to be able to help everybody learn beekeeping and to be able to pass on your knowledge. That's part of your obligation as a beekeeper is to help the new beekeepers learn. Thank you very much for all your questions. We've got time for one more. Great, Cedar, and, and just on that, so many people coming in with book ideas and things like that, which is just so awesome. And maybe this is a great question to end on, is that the fact that it is World Bee Day tomorrow. Any suggestions or tips that people could maybe do to sort of celebrate World Bee Day? So World Bee Day is about celebrating these extraordinary little insects that are such a crucial part of our food chain, our, our flora, or the interconnectedness of nature that we all completely depend on, right? So it's not only the European honeybee, but all of the native bee species. And one of the best things that we can all do is create some habitat. 
some of the little bees like here in Australia you've got the, the fire-tailed resin bee, you've got the blue banded bee, you've got um, all sorts of native bee species that ha often have a very short range and creating a bit of habitat in your yard will give those species stepping stones across the urban landscape. So you can do that simply by not maintaining part of your yard. Now that you can do a good thing by doing less work and just letting a space be wild. And when you have a wild space, that is what our bees call home. You can do that by creating habitat, by getting a whole lot of little bamboo tubes and cutting them up. Every year we run a fundraiser with offcuts of our flow hives created into these little pollinator houses. But you can make your own by just get, cutting up a whole lot of little tubes, bamboo tubes or reeds or even cardboard tubes and you'll find the different bee species will move in and use those tubes and call it home. You can even get a, a drill, get a bunch of different sizes, go to town on a piece of wood drilling holes and that will create some amazing habitat as well. Uh, even just leaving mulch around, some species will be nesting in leaf mulch and others like a muddy bank to, to dig a hole in. So any of this is fantastic habitat for bees and it's also a great thing for educating our children about the importance that all of these insects play and it's a great uh, window into a world, world that we all completely depend on. Thank you very much for asking all the questions. World Bee Day tomorrow, think about habitat, get out in your backyard, make some plans to create some. Take up beekeeping if you're interested. It's a wonderful sport. You can, uh, sport. <laughs> it can be a sport sometimes. It's a wonderful <laughs> hobby. You can produce real food from your backyard. It's ready for the table. It needs zero processing. Everybody loves honey and it, it's something you can share around your neighbourhood and it creates wonderful conversation.